join me in the call to worship from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, God's love endures forever. These are certainly strange and troubling times, but in our isolation, we are never alone. Please join me in the call to confession from Psalm 118. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than put confidence in people. Hear the assurance of pardon from Psalm 116 and be comforted. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, God saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Hello again. I'm Jeff Kunkel, interim pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. And first of all, let me say I miss seeing all of you. This is the best we can do right now, but I'm hoping this is helpful for you connecting to me and to the worship service and to other people. This morning scripture is from the Gospel of Luke. The 24th chapter, certain selections from that chapter. It's the beginning of a five-week series that I'm doing called Hope Rising. Let's listen to the scripture. That very day, two of the disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near them, and he went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. 
Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these last days? Hmm. And Jesus said, What things? Mm -hmm. And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, and they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels. Some of those who were with, with them went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said. So they drew near to the village on their walk, and he appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. I'm out in my backyard garden, folks. Uh, Mary Ellen Baylor, my wife, is filming this and our cat, Lytton, is around here somewhere under the chair. You might see her appear in the, in the filming. Let's get back to this Gospel of Luke story, which is one of my favorites of all the stories, what we call post-resurrection stories, or stories about life after Jesus was crucified. So we have in this story two disciples. Only one of them is named Cleopas. The others not even named. They were leaving Jerusalem. And this was on the third day after Jesus' crucifixion. And they were walking and talking together, moving towards a little town about seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. Uh, Emmaus is no longer there as a village, but they have found uh, archaeological evidence of a village being there in ancient times. Now it's uh, actually a, a, a small city that's there. They were on their way to Emmaus. We're not told why they were going there. Maybe they were just going to get out of Jerusalem and get out of the heat and try to get some space and try to figure out what happened to Jesus and what was happening to them and what would happen to them without Jesus. They had a lot to talk about. And they were walking and talking on the road to Jerusalem. And I love this, this simple little activity, walking and talking about the life of Jesus, about what it meant to them, about what it might mean to them now that Jesus was gone, but somehow had appeared or was still living and how to reckon with all these changes in their faith life and how they understood who they were and who Jesus was. Well, as they were talking, Jesus drew near to them, unrecognizable, and asked them the question, what are you talking about? And they were astonished and said, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been going on here? How Jesus of Nazareth, mighty of prophet deeds, mighty in spirit, our teacher, the one we hoped would redeem Israel. He was betrayed and arrested by the chief priests, crucified, dead, and buried. And we had hoped he was the one to save us and Israel. So, Jesus sort of joins the conversation at that point and opens up their thinking and opens up their understanding in a particular way, apparently, because by the time they get to Emmaus, 
Um, the day is uh, fast closing down, and they said, would you stay with us a little while? And uh, he did come into supper with them to somebody's mm -hmm. home. And there he broke the bread and he blessed it, and then he disappeared, vanished. And the disciples began to reckon with the fact that they had seen God appear to them somehow, that this was the living Christ, the body of Christ, who became real to them in that conversation and in that breaking of the bread. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as we spoke with him on the road? And didn't he open the scriptures for us? So this passage has a lot of very extraordinary things happening in it. Jesus drawing near. Jesus opening the scriptures. Jesus disappearing suddenly. But I don't want to talk about that as much as I want to talk about something very simple and ordinary that happens in this story and I hope is happening in your life. And that is the simple and beautiful act of one person of faith talking to another person of faith that they trust, who is safe to them, and the miracle that happens as two or more begin the kind of conversation about their faith and about what Jesus means to them, especially in times when their faith is shattered or shrinking or growing or changing. Have you ever come to a point where you have felt your faith is too small and you have to grow in faith? Those are the kind of moments we really need one person of faith talking to another trusted person of faith. You know, ever since the very first time I took my very real faith life to the pastor of my church some 45 years ago, a safe person, and he listened to my early and developing religious experience and my experience of the living God, and I was worried about what he'd say, but he said, yes, it sounds like this has to do with God, and it just relieved me and comforted me and allowed me to go on in my journey. That was the only exchange we really had and ever since then I've tried so hard to make sure that I've had at least one person in my life, a person of faith that I knew would understand me, that I knew had much to offer me, that I could talk to in a time of trouble or when my faith was being challenged or changed. The simple act of walking and talking with another person of faith, there's real power in it, folks. Hmm. And if you've never had that, start praying for that kind of person to appear or start looking for that kind of person in your life and risk that kind of conversation because there's a power and a beauty in it. I think that's where Jesus ends up saying at another point in the Gospels, where two or three are gathered, and he might add, talking about Jesus, there I am in the midst. You want Jesus to draw close, you want Jesus to be in the midst, recognized or unrecognized, find another person of faith, take the risk and trust them, and talk about all these things that are happening. My name's Heather Johnston. I'm the seminary intern here at First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. And today I would like to guide you in our prayers of the people. I'm gonna begin the prayer and then we're gonna take a pause. And during that pause, I am going to show you Lake Michigan and allow you to hear the waves crashing against the shore. And in that time, I'd like you to contemplate your own prayers. Maybe you have a neighbor that's lonely that needs prayer or a sick friend, or maybe your mind is just riddled with worry and you need prayers yourself. 
please take that moment to say those prayers out loud. Once we're done, I will end with Lord in your mercy. And I hope that you at home will respond with, hear our prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Creator, thank you for all of your many blessings. During a time where we feel like our world is spinning out of control, we know we are tethered to you, O oh God. Through this time where we search for things to be grateful for, also help us search for time to grieve our losses. Remind us to make space to mourn isolation, canceled plans, missed loved ones, and our very lives that have been turned upside down. I now invite you to contemplate and say your prayers out loud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift all these prayers up to you, both said and unsaid. We ask, just as the disciples asked Jesus in the Luke story, stay with us. For those across the world mourning losses, stay with them. For those around the globe that are suffering this pandemic in addition to food scarcity, violence, lack of access to essentials like clean water and shelter, stay with them. For those sick with worry, wondering when and if they'll ever see their loved ones again, stay with them. For those in the ICU on the precipice of death, stay with them. For the doctors, nurses, technicians, janitors, sterile processors working overtime to help heal the sick, stay with them. For grocery store clerks, gas station attendants, sanitation employees, and other essential staff, stay with them. For the grieving, stay with them. For the lonely, stay with them. For the homeschooling parents, stay with them. For those that have lost jobs and are not sure when their next paycheck or even their next meal may come from, stay with them. For those stuck in crowded prisons, Stay with them. For those suffering domestic violence, stay with them. For our family that lives outside, stay with them. For our federal leadership, God, push them. For our state leadership, God, continue to guide them. God, stay with us here at First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. Remind us that we are connected through you. Remind us that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is hope. Remind us of the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What shall I render the Lord? 
What shall my offering be for all the gracious benefits of God has bestowed on me? Great God of blessing, of faithful loving care, you are the font of goodness, the daily bread we share. How can we hope to thank you? Our praise is but a start, and sincerely and completely I offer you my heart. For our benediction today, I'd like to read you um, something written by an activist therapist um, by the name of Araya Baker, and it's called 15 Affirmations for Hope Amidst COVID-19. One, feeling emotionally exhausted as I process the constant flux of this crisis only means I am concerned, compassionate, and humanly vulnerable. Two, I rebuke the capitalistic conditioning that drives self-shaming whenever I prioritize much needed rest over grind culture and productivity. Three, my inability to focus or stay on task is my system's natural response to being overwhelmed and I only dehumanize myself by pathologizing how I am adapting. Four, mitigating my distress with good news, joy, pleasure, and self-care is a healing act of self-preservation, not self-indulgence. Five, small contributions to my community and within my networks are helpful and meaningful even if I'm not on the front lines. Six, muting pandemic related posts for the sake of my anxiety or altogether unplugging doesn't suggest I'm apathetic, disengaged or self-centered. Seven, my method of staying up to date with news can differ from everyone else's. Eight, Relapsing into maladaptive coping mechanisms is okay, as long as I consult my own accountability plan and or am honest with my accountability buddy. Nine, <clears throat> missing the physical touch or presence of others does not make me needy. 10, I am never alone, though I may feel forgotten about while social distancing. 11, 
COVID-19 recoveries are happening every day, and there is a collective effort beyond my awareness that will see us through. 12, I'm allowed to feel simultaneously fortunate slash grateful and miserable. 13, reaching out for help with my financial struggles takes bravery and radical vulnerability. 14, people can relate to my anxiety, existential dread, fear, grief, and hopelessness more than I presume. And if when I open up to others, I will be validated. 15, adjusting to change is difficult, but a new normal is underway and my role in bringing it to fruition matters immensely. Amen.